I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, Sal Singer. Please join us. Sal is going to be speaking about the future of survival. Thank you. So the topic is the future of survival, mind over technology. And what I mean by this is that the most important thing for reinventing big things in our lives is actually not so much technology, because we have the technology to do these things. It's being able to change our minds. It's imagination. And what do we mean by reinvention? This is important because reinvention is not just something 10% better. It's something 10x better, as Google defines a moonshot. It's like the difference between a horse and a car. You know, for example, Henry Ford asked people, or said, if he asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, because they couldn't imagine a car. So this is where imagination comes in. So I'm going to talk about reinventing three big things in our lives, basically using the technology we have now, health, education, and cities. So first, health. What is the problem with health now? What is the paradigm we need to change? Well, it's very simple. Right now, the way health works, but before I go to where, we, where health works, I have to say where we are in terms of the problem. And this illustrates the problem, which is uh, what causes us to die. These are the causes of premature death which is defined in the UK as uh, before 75. And this is all of the causes of premature death, uh, going to road accidents and so on. And as you can see here, the five dominant ones are heart, cancer, respiratory, nervous system, digestive disorders. All things that we're not born with, what are called chronic conditions, things that start somewhere at a particular time. And these are responsible for over 80% of what kills us. So this is what we need to deal with if we're going to have a different kind of health. But this is how health works now. We feel bad, and we go to the doctor. And what happens? The doctor does lots of checks. And uh, sometimes the news is bad. You know, we have stage 3 or stage 4 cancer. And as you see here, you know, on this timeline, the condition starts at zero and could go to 100%. Often, when we feel something and go to the doctor, it's pretty late in the day. And so the health system kicks in and tries to walk back this problem. But of course, if you start towards the end of the problem, it's very hard to deal with. And it's not always successful. And it also happens to be very expensive. So what's a better way to do health? I think everybody can agree on this. It's kind of a dream world where we detect things, we start somewhere at the beginning, where the problem is very small, where it's very easy to deal with, and of course, much more successful to deal with, and cheaper. So how can we get to this amazing world of early detection? which is really the essence of the new paradigm of health that's coming and that we can do right now. We're missing two things. The first is biomarkers. So right now our biomarker is discomfort, right? So we need a much better biomarker than that. We need a sign that there's something wrong with us, a sign to look for. And we don't really have many biomarkers today, and not good ones. So. How do we find these biomarkers? And also we have another problem, which is let's say we know we have a good biomarker. How do we know it's there? We're not doing blood tests every, every week or every month or even every year. So the biomarker doesn't do us much good if we're not looking for it. So we need something else. We need sensors to detect these biomarkers. And that's why I believe that if we get together again, certainly 10 years ago, but 10 years from now, or even five years from now, we are all going to be wearing sensors, or we'll have sensors inside our bodies 
or <laughs> we'll use sensors that we don't even need to put on our body, sensors like that measure breath, that measure voice, and are able to detect disease. And I'm not just talking about Fitbits and Apple Watches that kind of collect some data and stick it into somewhere that doesn't go anywhere. I'm talking about collecting as much da data as we can and pooling it and being able to discover things with it. Now, to understand how this works, it's called big data. And we know it everywhere in our lives. You know, Google is using it to predict what we're going to search and many other things about it. You know, Amazon is doing it to predict what we're going to buy. General Electric is using it to predict when its engines might break and fix that problem before it happens. Same with our cars. Our self-driving cars are going to use data to figure out how to drive. You know, we're using big data in everything except for one place, which is our own bodies. So all we're going to do is apply that technique, which allows us to predict things. The more data we collect, the more we can predict. Uh, the more we'll see patterns in that data that end up being a biomarker for a problem. So, uh, not only that, the way big data works is, so it's not just biomarkers and sensors, the sensors are going to find the biomarkers. That's the beauty of it. We're going to find what to search for with the things that we're searching with. So this is very exciting and it's coming, I think, in the near future. So, and it will be a completely different form of health. So we're actually going to look back at this time and we're going to say, how do we live like that? How do we live without any idea what's going on in our bodies? That will seem very strange, just like it seems strange now to have sensors uh, detecting everything in real time. So now I want to talk about reinventing education. And this too, I want to start with the problem. So, you know, let's go back to when we were all farmers. This here is uh, the sea of knowledge. Um, I, I love this uh, drawing. Um, and basically the task of education, it was to give us some piece of the sea of knowledge that would help us for life. And when we were all farmers, we didn't really need much education, just a tiny amount of education. Maybe none at all. And we could be great farmers without, uh, without education. But then the world got more complicated. We were working in factories. And suddenly what happened in the United States, and a big part of what the, makes the United States the, what it is today, is what happened in the 1930s and 40s, which is called the high school revolution. The U.S. was the first country, way before Europe, that basically everybody had to go to high school. And with that kind of education, you know, in the 50s, if you had a high school degree, you know, you, you could get a pretty good job. You could be in the middle class. That was what you needed. But then the world got more complicated again. And we're in the information age, and, you know, let's say 1990. And so we solved that problem again by doing the same thing not changing education, just getting more of it. We suddenly needed university degrees. But if we got that degree, again, we were all set. We could get a great job. We were snapped up. Uh, but then, you know, that didn't work either. So that's where we are today. We're at a education that basically hit a wall. Now, why is that? Because education is about knowledge. And, like, what else could it be about? Of course it's about knowledge. But... We, uh, we can never, not any longer get a body of knowledge, which by the way is very tiny in the sea of knowledge, but we can't get a certain body of knowledge that's going to take us through the rest of our lives. What we really need is a bunch of things beyond knowledge, and this is what this guy, Andre Schleicher, who's basically the education minister of Europe, the guy who invented the PISA tests, if you know about those, uh, Here's what he says. He says, the world economy doesn't hire you for what you know, because Google knows everything. So the world economy hires you for what you can do with what you know. And we don't learn how to do things. We don't learn all of these, what they're calling now, 21st century skills or soft skills or um, life skills. We don't learn about strategic thinking or decision making or communication or emotional intelligence, curiosity. Kind of, I hate the word skills because it's curiosity a skill. 
You know, skills is not doesn't capture all these things that we need today. Courage, I noticed in the description of Creative Morning, uh, it says talks about bravery. Courage and bravery is part of being creative. You know, all these things are what we need in life. And there's no curriculum for these things. We don't test for these things. So, of course, we're not getting these things in school. So, to sweep in now Startup Nation, a big reason that we are a Startup Nation is this very weird thing about Israel, which is that we serve in the army. And this military service actually has been giving us the things that we weren't getting in school. It's been giving us these 21st century skills. That one of the main things that military service has given us is the idea of a mission and the idea of sacrifice for something larger than yourself. I mean, what is a mission? It's a challenge. It's a problem you need to solve. It's a real job also. Reality is an important uh, part of this. Um, and if you are able, I mean, basically what happens in, in the military service is they throw lots of challenges at you, and these challenges are generally things that you're not able to do or you think you're not able to do that you don't really have the training for, and yet you do them anyway. So you come out of that experience and you think, hey, I did all these things that I thought were impossible. Maybe I could do other things that seem impossible, and that's a startup. And a startup is just a mission. And you break it down into smaller missions to accomplish that startup. And you have to be super determined. You have to be willing to take risks. So this is a big part of why we're a startup nation. But the, this is the wrong way to get these skills. You know, we shouldn't be getting them in the army. And in the rest of the world, you just can't do it that way. So we have actually the secret to reinventing education that we stumbled on by accident. We don't even know that it's the secret. And that secret is to kind of bottle what Israelis are getting, the kind of skills that Israelis are getting in the military, and stick it into education. And I think there are ways to do this, but we have to understand that education must be now about those things that are beyond knowledge. And actually, if we aim to get those things, I think we're going to do a much better job of getting knowledge as well. So now I want to talk about reinventing cities. And this is one of my favorite parts. And uh, I, I, you know, I call this sustainable survival, uh, both in the sense of environmental st sustainability, because cities are by far the biggest consumers of energy. And if you really want to reduce uh, carbon and so on, you have to do it in cities. Uh, you have to have a different kind of city. But I mean also sustainable in the sense of livable. I mean, our cities are becoming less livable. Most things in life are getting better, but our cities are getting worse, and we know why. It's because of this. Now, this happens to be uh, 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 in China. Um, and I, I speak to a lot of Chinese groups, and, and they say, oh, yeah, yes, we recognize that one. Um, uh, but it's not just, you know, these extreme cases. We're suffering with traffic here, of course. We're suffering with traffic everywhere. And we're desperate to solve this problem. And one way we tried this to solve this problem is to build more highways. Like maybe we can build a kind of a three-dimensional highway. That's what a cloverleaf is. And uh, the, actually the picture on the left here from Shanghai is the intersection with the most levels in the world. It has six levels. That's a record. Um, but of course, there's tons of traffic in Shanghai. There's tons of traffic in Los Angeles, of course. We can't solve this problem this way. In fact, all the studies show that the more highways you build, the more traffic you get. Kind of counterintuitive, but we, we can see that it's true. So what's the solution? A lot of people are pinning their hopes on driverless cars, because it's like a new kind of transportation, and you know, maybe this is it. But you know, driverless cars are great, they're gonna happen, there are a lot of advantages to them, they're certainly better than cars with drivers. 
But, you know, we're not so good drivers. Um, but they're not the solution to traffic. And there's a guy called Elon Musk who's actually building driverless cars. And this is what he says. Basically, he says it's cars become cheaper and more available. You know, your grandmother can send cars out, your kids can send cars out. Companies will put their inventories in cars to deliver, you know, straight from the cars that are roaming around. You know, there will be more uses and more demand for cars in the driverless car world. It's kind of like building more highways. It just won't work. So he says actually traffic will get worse. But he's right. So this is not the solution to traffic. So what's the solution? So look at this picture. If you counted the cars, there are about 200 cars in this picture. But the people in these cars actually don't take up a, a lot of space. Uh, let's say you took the cars away and you just looked at the people. You know, there's plenty of room. Uh, why, why are these cars taking up so much space? You know, and, and what if we just, you know, put all those people, we could fit them in two buses. You know, that, that sounds great, but of course, we don't take buses. Buses, buses can't solve the problem because they're going to be stuck in the same traffic. So maybe, what if we put those people into kind of little pods? And what if we took those pods and we glue them on a rail? very fast, way above the street. This is a system of, it, of transportation that people have been working on for many years. It's called personal rapid transit. So there's like mass transit in big things like trains and buses. And there's personal rapid transit, which is the same idea but in small vehicles. Basically each vehicle has one destination. It could have one or two people in it. And if you look at this picture, you can see that there are two lines, you know, one going underneath the other. And what this shows is that if you build a grid of this stuff, it's a three-dimensional grid. It's like having a cloverleaf interchange at every intersection. If you're going through, you don't stop. If you want to stop and if you want to change lines, you change lines. And what this means is if you build a grid, kind of like a subway grid in Manhattan, where you're, you're a close walk from any station, from a station, if you cover a city this way with this kind of system, you get on where you are, you get off where you're going without stopping. You're by yourself, uh, and it's super fast. So that basically, the reason why we love cars is because we get on where we're going, we get off where we, we get on where we are. We get off where we're going. We don't stop. We don't have a schedule. It's on demand. This is why it's so hard to get a, get us out of our cars because we only something that's better can get us out of our cars. So this system has all those characteristics that we love about cars, but you don't have to park. You're not in traffic. And this I this is a super high capacity system. I know that you know. You look at this, you think it's a toy. How can this thing carry you know million people? And but the fact is that when you build a grid like this, it actually has more capacity than a normal mass transit system because uh, it's running all the time. It's not running every ten minutes or five minutes or whatever. Uh, and the other thing you're probably thinking is, oh, this is ugly. I don't want this thing flying around my face. That's all I need is another layer of in infrastructure on top of all the mess that we have now. But the way to understand this, I think, is not that it adds ugliness, but that it removes ugliness. Because it allows you to remove cars. It allows you to pedestrianize parts of cities. If you think about the parts of cities that you love, where are all the people? They're in the places that don't have cars. Like just recently, we made a railroad track into a park. And all these people come out of the woodwork. They're running, they're walking, they're doing everything. They're having, you know, gatherings, meetups, everything in this little thin park going through Jerusalem. So what if we could pedestrianize whole swaths of the city? Because we're giving people another way to get there. 
So basically, it removes a lot. It removes ugliness. Doesn't add ugliness. Um, so the good news is that this is actually happening. This is a rendering from a, a place in Abu Dhabi where they're going to build this system. This is them showing how it's going to look. And as you can see, there's no cars underneath uh, uh, the transportation system. Uh, this is the way it should be. And the very good news is that the first places to build this are Abu Dhabi and Israel. Uh, the places most interesting building this right now are Hutsali and Natanya, and they're going to build pilot systems. And we could see those pilot systems running in maybe about, about two years, two to three years. And uh, this could expand very quickly. And uh, I think actually, um, I hope that we won't have to build any more light rail systems uh, that are driving us crazy. <coughs> And, uh, and that this really is the transportation of the future. So I'll pretty much end with that and with this message that reinventing big things is actually the future of innovation. You know, in Startup Nation, the, the book is translated into 30 uh, languages roughly because all these countries want to know how can they be like Silicon Valley? How can they be like Israel in terms of having tons of startups. Because startups are the key to innovation in their view. And they are. You know, they, they're a big part of innovation. But now everybody has startups. And it's incredible. Everywhere I go, I, I was in Vietnam recently, I saw some amazing startups there. Um, so startups are not enough. Actually, the countries that are going to be seen as most innovative are the ones that reinvent big things. Because these things are going to happen, but they're not going to happen everywhere at once. Uh, as great quote I love is, the future is here, it's, not, it's just not evenly distributed. That, that always happens. The future comes somewhere first, and the countries that build the future first are going to be considered the most innovative countries. And another thing I believe is very exciting about this is we don't need any new technology. We have plenty of sensors we can do to reinvent health. Changing education requires no technology. Um, changing cities, we have, we're able to build these systems now. So the hard part is not technology, the hard part is being able to imagine something very different and deciding to go there. It's all about leadership and imagination. So. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Saul. Um, we have time for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, so, hi. Uh, my name is Raquel. I work in education. I'm just interested in hearing a little more detail about an example that you propose to change pedagogy to reflect the gains that the Army makes that you think can be moved up in time. So there's so many really interesting experiments going on. One that I'm most excited about is a uh, woman, a professor from MIT, her name is Christine Ortiz, has gone on leave from MIT to build a new kind of university. It's a project-based university that will have no subjects, no lectures, uh, no real line drawn between graduate and undergraduate, uh, no departments, very radical rethink of education to adapt to the world that we're in now, which is uh, we're, we're inventing new subjects all the time by combining different disciplines. And the, the significance of this to me is if you reinvent the university, that, that just transmit down the, down the chain because our education system is now built to basically get into the university to produce people who can get into the university. So if the university changes, everything else has to change. But I would say in K through 12, we can do project-based learning. We can do, uh, you know, there's a school here in Israel that starting in first grade, they're basically doing startups in the sense that they are solving problems. They pick a problem to solve, and they solve. They try to solve it as a, as a class, as a group. Uh, we can do a lot more peer-to-peer -peer learning. 
You know, there's another, uh, Yako Peck, who's an amazing educator. I'm, I'm very interested in the democratic school concept, which I think has a lot to teach us. Uh, he's now sort of on a campaign to, uh, instead of giving grades to individuals, let the grade go to the whole class. Actually, it's a very interesting similarity to the way uh, basic training works. But one of the big things they're trying to teach you is it's not you that matters, it's the unit that matters. So if the unit screws up, you're going to suffer. And if the unit does well, that's good for you. So you have to think as a unit. So actually, that's, uh, I think, important for life. And so if you test things on a class basis, basically you create an environment of peer-to-peer -peer learning. The stronger kids help the weaker kids, and, and everyone's strong in something and weak in another thing. So, and teaching is one of the best ways to learn. So there, there's so many great models out there can, that can be done right now, uh, and also I think can reshape education in the future. Anyone else? Yes. So, so following your logic, the army, your emphasis is on a very demanding environment. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't we just make education more demanding, which is actually a very conservative idea? This is the revolution. Well, not demanding in the sense of uh, you know doing harder math tests and things like that. I'm not if that's what you're talking about. There, there are people who say that's what we need to do with education. We shouldn't be dumbing it down. We should give uh, harder tests and, and you know, raise our bar in terms of what we're learning. But that doesn't solve the problem. That's, that's a, a faster horse attitude. It's, it's uh, trying to make the system we have uh, better. And it completely ignores all the things that we're not trying to teach at all, and which that's the bigger problem. So. Uh, Challenges are one way to get people, give people these kind of, you know, 21st century skills. And education systems are now talking about this. They're saying, oh, we need to do this. We need to, you know, teach people how to think, teach people, you know, learn how to learn. But they, they, they talk the talk, but they're not walking the walk. You know, it's not serious. Because again, if you don't have a curriculum for it, if you don't have a test for it, then you know that, you know, how many times have teachers said, you know, both students and teachers uh, have said, well, we'd like to study this, but it's not on the test, so we don't have time. You know, uh, this is, this is a, a huge burden on, on teachers and students, and that's why I love these things called mechino which are, Mechina means preparation in Hebrew, and they're these gap year programs that people take, when they graduate from high school, they postpone their army service, and they do this gap year thing where you're learning what you want to learn, and you're building your own, you're finding people you're, you're interested in to help you learn this stuff. You're volunteering, you're traveling around the country. It's all the stuff you wish you could have learned about in school, but it wasn't on the test. Okay, so my dream, actually in starting to fix the Israeli system, is to take all of 12th grade and turn it into a mechina. Graduate basically at the end of 11th grade and turn uh, uh, 12th grade, where you're not doing much anyway, into a mechina. And kids will learn more in that year and get more out of that year than they did in the previous uh, rest of their education. Oh. So well, tell me about that later. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? Yes. Hi, my name is Alia. Um, about eight years ago, I think when, around the time when uh, Care of Nation came out, I heard you give a panel in Tel Aviv, actually, at the University of Wisconsin and Orbitary and Shemek mm. Um I love the book. What is next for you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, what you're seeing here has um, been developed with a lot of thinking uh, towards the next book. The idea for the next book is basically to, in a way, ask what's next for Startup Nation, take Israel as a, a case study of what any country needs to do to survive in the, in the coming world and to be part of a world of rapid change. 
and to get this message across that we need to reinvent big things and the countries that do this first, that's the way to get into the top tier. So you got to talk about, you know, what does reinventing big things look like? And so I've become obsessed with these particular reinventions. Uh, so that's what I like to talk about these days. Thank you so much, Salvi.